Welcome to today's session presented by Hospital for Special Care and Hartford Healthcare. Unfortunately, our colleague from Hartford Healthcare was not able to join us today. So I will be your presenter and then moderator for our panelist session a little later on this afternoon. We are thrilled to have you join us today. I wanna let everyone know that this session is being recorded. Attendees are participating in listen only mode, but they can interact using the chat pane on your screen. So if you have questions during the session, please just type them into the chat box and we will address them verbally at the end of the formal presentations. Next slide, please. All right, so here's a little overview of the program for this afternoon. So we're gonna discuss who I am and why we're all sitting here together watching this. We are then going to dive into brain changes and uh, patterns that occur with normal aging. And then we're gonna discuss whether the changes that uh, people may be experiencing, whether they're considered to be normal or perhaps some not so normal changes. And where should, where should you go? Where should you send loved ones if there are concerns about uh, changing in brain functioning that, uh, that may be problematic? Next slide, please. So who is this guy? This guy is me. Uh, my name is Dr. Anthony Rinaldi. I am a board certified uh, neuropsychologist and a lot of people may be wondering what in the world is a neuropsychologist? That's a fair question. So really the term indicates someone who has a doctorate degree in psychology and receives a bit of extra specialized training in uh, neuropsychology. And so the neuro prefix really points to a person who has special understanding of, of brain and behavior relationships. And taking that a little further basically means that uh, people like myself have um, a little extra understanding as to how well different brain structures and connections between different areas of the brain, how they're able to impact a way a person thinks, behaves, and moves, how well we can learn, use language, solve problems. And we have extensive training in a variety of paper and pencil and computer-based tests that allow us to measure basically how well different areas of the brain or different pathways between brain structures, how well they're able to work and coordinate that make basically make us human, that, that makes us uh, who we are. So I am also a, the co-director for the Center for Cognitive Health, and we'll go into a little more detail as to what that is as part of the Hospital for Special Care. Uh, next slide. All right, so we have the aging brain. So brain aging has three kind of general categories. So there's considered to be normal aging, there is considered to be a mild cognitive impairment or the more recent term mild neurocognitive disorder, um, sometimes shortened down to just MCI. And then there is dementia. So as you move up from normal aging to MCI to dementia, we have increasing in, in severity for brain changes. And to normal aging is obviously the changes that occur in everybody's brain as they get older, which we will discuss in just a moment. Um, the mild cognitive impairment indicates that there's some decline in functioning, some decay that's greater than would be expected for age, but is not so severe that it necessarily impacts daily functioning. And daily functioning refers to things like shopping, cooking, driving, uh, keeping up with work performance and things of that nature, or people are at least able to use some compensatory strategies to allow them to function at the level they've been able to historically, despite some mild changes in functioning. Should a person unfortunately be diagnosed with a dementia process, this indicates that the decline is likely much more severe from baseline in, the, in, a, in their brain functioning. And this is also best indicated by a person having difficulty with their daily functioning. So the previous abilities to compensate and continue to work and drive and manage a household and care for loved ones that were still present in MCI are no longer available and no longer 
applicable to an individual uh, with a dementia syndrome. So basically these people are ones that need assistance in their daily functioning. Um, next slide. All right. So now the big question is of course, what is normal aging versus what is not so normal aging? And so this is obviously a very sparse slide and the context is a lot more intricate than this, but trying to keep it as um, digestible as possible. So when we're talking about normal aging, we're really talking about uh, subtle changes in brain functioning. And these are gonna be mild changes over time that would be expected that everybody experiences just as a normal course of aging, much in the same way that our bodies kind of change over time. We become, you know, we, we become not quite as strong, we're not quite as quick, and by extension, we don't quite think as sharply as we used to. And normal changes are most usually seen in tasks and demands that require a very rapid thinking and processing of information and uh, paying sustained attention uh, to tasks that a person is, is working on. So when concerns in aging and brain health become not so normal, uh, these changes become much more significant. So again, we're talking about matters of degree where the change in functioning is much more substantial rather than mild changes that are more insidious over time and can affect several more domains of functioning, not just those that require uh, speed and, and attentional abilities. So these may include uh, most notably uh, memory functioning, particularly for forming new memories. There may be changes in behavior, mood and personality. There may be some change in language functioning, such as uh, word finding or sentence structure, uh, communication abilities. And these changes are going to worsen and become more impaired over time at a rate that's much greater than we would expect uh, as opposed to normal aging alone. The next slide. So, as I've mentioned before, age-related brain changes. So our bodies do change with age, unfortunately, despite our best efforts. And because our brains are, you know, encased inside of our skull and inside of our bodies, um, the changes that they experience are much harder to see for very obvious reasons. Uh, we can see our bodies change over time and the, in the exterior, like the muscles and the skin and, and things of that nature. But it's really hard to see changes in function and in outcome and things of that nature that our, that our brain controls. So there are some skills, like I had mentioned before, that tend to peak around a person's uh, early 30s or so, and then may very slowly start to decline as folks get into the 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond. And these are, again, going to be tasks and skills such as thinking speed, um, sustained attention, and multitasking, and word finding to a certain degree. Sustained attention is more where uh, basically concentration is a person able to hone in on what they're trying to pay attention to, like this lecture, and being able to uh, filter out any other distractions, like if something else is going on around you, or there's some other mildly interesting thing in your periphery, can a person push that to the side and focus on the task at hand. Uh, multitasking also tends to go down. Multitasking referring to um, trying to do multiple things at the same time. So bouncing back and forth between a few different types of tasks and being able to manage progress on each of those without letting any one particular task drop or making an increase in errors. And lastly, uh, word finding changes can also be found. And these are often referred to as tip of the tongue phenomena. So the idea that you see something and you ask the person, oh, can you grab me that thing over there? You know, the, the thing that you use to wipe your face or what do you call it? Uh, tissue, please, may I have a tissue? And that might be an example of word finding difficulties that will happen sporadically as we get older and increase just a little bit, even in folks um, with normal aging. Hopefully I don't experience too many of these while we're working together today. Next slide, please. So luckily there are other skills that can remain sharp and stable or even potentially improve over time. So most notably would be things like, like a person's vocabulary ability. So the number of words that people know and their ability to use 
language and, and develop word meaning tend to remain relatively stable, if not improve over time. So individuals that continue to expose themselves to reading and learning and education and social interaction, our ability to use language by and large remains relatively sharp. And we can even learn new words and things like that as we get older. Similarly, the ability to read is something that remains sharp and can even improve where our practice with reading different types of material and coursework and things like that uh, remain either remain stable through a person's life depending on the kind of lifestyle that they lead or they may even improve if a person is an avid reader or in, starts to put themselves in a position where they may take on uh, learning new tasks or new hobbies or new career fields. And lastly, another skill is uh, pattern recognition. So this would be the idea of being able to see a series of uh, pictures or a or seeing a, a pattern of a sequence of information and then being able to deduce what would come next or how each of the items in a grouping are alike or what makes a one part of a pattern different than the rest of it. That kind of pattern recognition ability tends to remain pretty stable you know, even as we age. Next slide. So what are some signs and symptoms of not so normal aging? So I've got about 10 of these, five on the next couple of slides and I'll just kind of go over uh, each of these so folks can get some idea as to what the not so normal aging process might look like. First and foremost, for a lot of individuals would be memory loss that tends to disrupt daily life. So this would be something where people are rapidly forgetting information, where you tell somebody something and not but a few minutes later, they have completely forgotten that you mentioned it when it comes back up in conversation again. Similarly, individuals that tend to repeat themselves in conversation, like they tell a story or they provide an anecdote and then just a few minutes later, and they provide the same anecdote again, and usually without much knowledge of the fact that the previous interaction with that information has already occurred. And there's usually substantial increase in compensatory strategies and memory cues that don't really seem to help, where a person may be writing down things to try to help them, but they have to write the same thing down multiple times in such a way that it tends not to really aid the person in learning and retrieving the information. Because there is a little bit of change in memory functioning that is normal as we get older. We just can't quite remember as much or as quickly as we used to. And that's, and that's a totally normal expectation. But again, when people are experiencing very rapid loss of information or repeating themselves frequently in conversation, those can be uh, more worrisome signs of more rapid decline. Difficulties planning and problem solving. So this often, impacts daily functioning. So considering things like tracking monthly bills and expenses, uh, following recipes to be able to make uh, multi-course meals, completing work tasks um, that may be multi-step or may require uh, novel problem solving abilities, and even taking you know, substantially longer than previously to complete tasks that a person was able to do before. Um, examples of this might be if a person normally only needs an hour to, to balance a checkbook at the end of the month. And all of a sudden you notice that it's taking them two, two and a half hours to do the same task and having to double and triple check their work. Whereas previously they were able to do it once, maybe a quick double check and then they'd be fine. Or if a person is having difficulty with completing routine tasks in, in their work environment and supervisors may be making comments as to, hey, I've noticed that you're having some difficulties or this seems to be kind of trickier for you than it used to be. What's going on? Those can be uh, concerns that aging and changes in brain functioning are becoming problematic. We can be issues finishing uh, regular or normal tasks. So this would be more representative of tasks that are overlearned. So things that we do, objects that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis that are so familiar to us that we really don't even have to think about them very much. A lot of what we call motor memory or procedural memory. And so this can be an example of forgetting the rules to a common card game or board game that, we, that a person might play all the time. Uh, when driving, getting lost, going to a familiar place such as the grocery store that a person always goes to or the same primary care provider they've been going to for the last 20 years um, difficulties using the TV remote when it's been the exact same TV they've had for the last 10 years. 
those kind of concerns finishing um, what we would call overlearned tasks can be an indication of uh, more substantial decline. Time and place confusion can also be found in not so normal aging. So these are individuals who have difficulty keeping track of the time and date. And well, I'm not talking about individuals that are retired and they don't have to keep track of their every waking moment and knowing whether today's Monday or Tuesday or maybe the 15th or the 16th of the month. I'm talking when people are off by a couple of months or they're many, many days off and they have difficulty sequencing when they just completed one task and move on to the next one. That's the kind of confusion and ordering of information that, that can be a concern. Visual and spatial information processing can also be an indication of some normal aging. So this uh, is often most, most well noted with driving behaviors. So if you notice that yourself or somebody tends to have issues backing out of the garage and they're, they've lost a couple of mirrors over the last month or all of a sudden you see that your, your parent or loved one is jumping a lot of curbs when they're trying to, when they're trying to make corners and they pop a couple tires or parking very crooked in parking spots or having accidental fender benders because of difficulty judging distance between the car in front and the car that you're at now. That kind of awareness of person's body and their surroundings in space um, when that starts to decline significantly, that can be an indication of some concern. Uh, next slide, please. So the last few symptoms that may be worrisome include some problems with language. And so this isn't to include the occasional word finding difficulty or issues learning the name of somebody that maybe you just met. This would be things like more severe word finding difficulties where, in, where conversations are becoming choppy and people are noticing that it's taking a long time to find the right word or trying to substitute words that don't really work for the conversation. Um, and perhaps uh, interjecting words that are either completely incorrect or that may have a different sound to them than previously. Those kind of changes in communication are, are very rare to find in someone in just normal aging can be indication for concern. Uh, misplacing things can be a problem. Now, I know everybody misplaces things sometimes. I misplace things with some frequency. I've recently moved myself and I have a habit of misplacing my belt because I've yet to find a good place to put it. And that can be a very normal part of daily functioning. However, when people are putting things in very unusual places and not able to find them or putting them down and then within a few moments, not remembering exactly where they put the object, um, the person that's putting the keys in the refrigerator or the milk in their desk drawer, that kind of concern tends to be more problematic. Now, poor decision-making can be an indication of problems with aging. This is why a lot of times individuals who are scammers on the internet tend to try to target people that are increasing in age because there's a concern that a person might not be able to have the awareness that the situation they're being presented with doesn't make a lot of sense. And so they could be scammed by sending a bunch of gift cards to somebody that they don't, that they don't recognize or trying to give a donation to a company that, they, that they've never heard of or, or perhaps even just making poor decisions in their, in their daily functioning such as decreased kind of self-care or things of that nature. Social withdrawal can be something that can happen as part of natural normal aging. So an individual who is previously very outgoing and very social, loves spending time with family and friends and loved ones, tends not to be that interested. They don't want to go out as much anymore. They, they're all of a sudden becoming a homebody. And sometimes that can be a, a reflection of concern that a person has on some level that they're not functioning quite as well as they should. And by extension, want to remove themselves from an embarrassing uh, situation. And lastly, some other signs can be other mood and behavioral changes. So this might be uh, periods of confusion where a person seems to have difficulty understanding uh, situations that are going on around them. There can be significantly reduced frustration tolerance. So a person seems to have a much quicker temper than they used to and are seem to be getting more upset and more anxious or frustrated over situations that used to really never bother them. Um, those kind of signs can be indicative of problematic aging changes. Next slide. So after going through this list, unfortunately, I probably worried a few people. And so if, if you're one of these people that I've worried, I apologize. 
And the next step is what should we do about this? And the next step usually is ideally to talk to your doctor or APRN, PCP, if you're seeing a neurologist, a geriatrician, any medical mental health provider that you're working with and, and let them know that you have these concerns and you can ask for, or they may offer an opportunity for a neuropsychological referral. Uh, another option some providers are comfortable with is that they may provide you with a bit of a cognitive screener. So basically a shortened version of the kind of tests and measures that uh, people like myself do to get a sense as to whether there may be some changes in, in brain health and brain functioning that are worse than expected that would definitely warrant a referral for services such as my own. Or if you don't wanna to have to do that, you just wanna, you're very, very much a self-starter and you just wanna figure out what's going on immediately, you're more than welcome to give us a call, uh, the hospitals for special care specifically. And you can discuss an evaluation and self-referral and indicate that you want to have a referral for uh, testing to determine how well your brain is functioning. And we can obtain background information from um, other medical providers to figure out what's been going on for you. So we can try to provide you with some, with some help and assistance. Next slide. So you would then become part of uh, Hospital for Special Care's Center for Cognitive Health. So this is a multidisciplinary clinic for individuals that are worried about mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And as I mentioned previously, most individuals are referred via a provider. There are some folks who are self-refer and it generally starts with meeting with a neuropsychologist such as myself. And you complete an evaluation with us that usually takes about three hours plus or minus from start to finish. And this would consist of the paper and pencil based test that I had that I was referring to earlier, um, an in depth background interview about your medical history, mental health history, gathering information from collateral sources like family and friends and loved ones, uh, questionnaires, and uh, the brain games and tests that I had referred to earlier. Then, about one week later, that gives us time to take in scoring all the results that you gave us. Uh, generating a comprehensive report that outlines all of the different performances that a person provided, creating a, creating a sheet basically that indicates areas of strength and potential areas of deficit with uh, diagnoses as they're warranted and a treatment plan that a person can take to be able to try to help them maximize their functioning. Next slide. So once you're finished with someone like myself, there may be uh, several other referrals that we can make. And the beauty of our center is that we have a lot of, we have all of this care available in-house. And you'll learn more about this from the content specific providers in just a little bit. So we have speech language pathology services. We have occupational therapists, physical therapy. We have rehab psychology and general psychology providers. We have an aquatic therapy department and coming very soon, we will have a social work uh, service available to us as, as well. So any and all of these services that would normally require multiple referrals to multiple different agencies and different buildings can all be completed with us here under one roof. Next slide. So in summary, all brains change with age and we think a little bit more slowly, we make more mistakes and that's completely normal. However, being no noticing or being told that there may be some more significant changes in brain functioning may potentially indicate some mild cognitive impairment or worst case scenario, a dementia process. So if we have these sort of concerns for either oneself or loved ones, it's important to talk to your doctor and get a referral or self-refer for an evaluation with us here at the Cognitive Health Center. And if a person is diagnosed with a mild cognitive impairment or dementia process, being able to seek out additional treatments such as speech language pathology, OT, PT, uh, individual therapy, psychology, or a geriatric care as well. And, and all of these services are available to individuals who come through our doors here at the hospital for special care. And we would love to have you all if you have any uh, interest and desire. Next slide, please.
So I would like to now uh, welcome to the screen um, one of my colleagues um, who you would meet with here in your time at the Center for Cognitive Health. This is Alison Gallagher here to talk about speech language pathology services. Thank you, Dr. Rinaldi. I so appreciate hearing your talk and hearing um, everything that you do with the Center for Cognitive Health. So um, after a neuropsychological evaluation with Dr. Rinaldi, one of the referrals, as was mentioned, is um, to come work with speech therapy. And oftentimes the first question I get is, well, what does speech therapy have to do with my memory or my thinking skills? And um, so that's what I would like to talk about here today on this next slide, please. Um, so a speech therapist is um, an individual who is trained to work with some of those changes that might be happening in that not so normal aging that was mentioned. So if you've been identified as somebody who's noticing some changes, potentially you would come to work with someone like me. Often fo following neuropsychological evaluation, you would come to speech therapy. And our evaluation sessions here at the hospital get to be a little bit shorter than those three hours that were mentioned in the neuropsychological evaluation because I'm able to have access to all of that information that Dr. Rinaldi already found about you. You're not starting from square one, we're moving into, so we notice that there's a change, what can we do about that? You can expect that typically for, in our center, I see you for once or twice a week and our sessions are 60 minutes. You might be wondering, what do I do during those sessions? Especially if I can talk, what do I do this during, during those sessions? Well, we, the first thing that we often like to start with is auditing or just noticing whatever things that you do already to support your memory. Oftentimes, family and loved ones notice that there's a change in someone's memory, and we start throwing things at that. Maybe it's sticky notes. Maybe it's um, tying a string around your finger. Maybe it's reliance on a loved one or just the, my worst phrase in English, just remembering. And I just take a sense of what, what do you do right now to support your memory? And we take a look to see how we can optimize that. So in Dr. Rinaldi's example, he just moved. He's noticing a trend that's frustrating for him. He can't find his belt. He doesn't have a consistent place to put that. That would be something that you and I would work on and to figure out how can we have a strategy that can support that thing that's frustrating for you. Um, my memory strategy optimization is informed by some of the work by Dr. Andrew Budson, a neurologist in the, in the Boston area, which just says, you know, there's a lot of different ways to support your memory. Uh, what makes one memory strategy, like putting something in your phone, better than another memory strategy, like writing it down on a piece of paper or asking your spouse? Well, in Dr. Budson's work, he's found that there are three kind of golden rules that can be predictive of success in whatever way that you're trying to remember. And they are to keep it simple. So have one way that you're going to remember something rather than 15 different ways that we learn. Um, another is to make it routine. That's tapping into that procedural memory that Dr. Rinaldi was speaking of. It's a very robust, vibrant type of memory that we'd love to offload some of our daily tasks onto. So every time you have to remember something, doing it the same way. And don't delay, which is just as soon as you have to remember something, it's a very easy decision tree. Either do it or write it right in that moment. Um, a lot of speech therapy is informed by some of the work by McKay and Solberg, just studies that show that if we're trying to learn a new skill, we go through these three stereotypical steps. And the first is acquire. Do you know what strategy is going to be helpful for you in order to remember what you need to do? The second is to apply. Can you do it when I assign you a task? Can you do, use that strategy for my purposes? And then the ultimate goal is adapt. Can you use the strategy that you learn in speech therapy to make your life easier and remember the things that are important for you? I walk you through that process, um, starting at each of the stages and help you through that. 
Another thing we might do together is improve your awareness of and your predictive power of when you're going to remember something and when you're less likely to. So oftentimes in speech, I sit down and I say, how did this week go? Um, and what went well for you? What can we attribute that success to? Why were you able to remember that thing? Or conversely, what didn't go well? And how can we support that situation? Another thing that was mentioned in our 10 symptoms of not so, age, not so normal aging was this word retrieval piece. So clearly a speech therapist is the individual who um, is able to help support some of that coming up with the right word at the right time. And we do, a, we have a lot in our tool bag to support that for you. So that's some of what you could look forward to in speech therapy. Um, thankfully, I'm working as part of a team and a speech therapist isn't the only one that can be supportive of cognitive health. So I'd like to welcome my colleague, Carolyn Brown, who is an occupational therapist. Oftentimes in our center, I will begin with a patient and then hand them off potentially um, to Dr. Or excuse me, to um, Carolyn Brown. So Carolyn, thank you. Thank you so much, Allie. Great to be here. Um, as Alia mentioned, I'm an occupational therapist in the outpatient rehab department of Hospital for Special Care. Think about occupation as any activity that you do throughout your day or night. Uh, this can include sleeping, bathing yourself, uh, making dinner, uh, paying your bills, driving, and socializing with your friends. You are engaging in occupation. Occupational therapy benefits cognitive health by asking you what occupations are most meaningful to you. And we help you identify what barriers are preventing you from engaging in those occupations successfully. I'll list some examples that are similar to some of the examples Dr. Rinaldi spoke of earlier. Um, you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Examples could include uh, um, getting lost several times while you're taking a walk or you can't find your way home after driving to church, or you simply wanna make yourself a grilled cheese sandwich, but you've forgotten to turn the burner off one too many times, or you can't remember what ingredients to use. These are all examples of occupational performance problems. Occupational therapies, uh, therapists address these problems by one, teaching you strategies to improve the safety and independence in your home. We may recommend that you increase the lighting in dimly lit areas of your home or reduce bright fluorescent lighting that is causing too much glare in the home. We may recommend placing reflective tape on your steps uh, to prevent tripping or taping down the edge of your carpet to prevent tripping. We may recommend uh, placing bump dots on your microwave uh, buttons so you, so you can be oriented to which buttons um, that you use most often. We may recommend a GPS tracker so your loved ones can locate you if you're taking a walk. And we'll also recommend other measures to prevent um, fire hazards within your home. So these are examples of home modifications to improve safety and independence in your home. And our recommendations really vary depending on the severity of the cognitive loss. OTs also help to maintain a healthy lifestyle. What is a healthy lifestyle? That's one that gives you the best quality of life that you can at that moment. We do this by teaching strategies for you to successfully perform personal hygiene or home, man home management tasks yourself. There is a direct correlation between too much caregiver assistance and loss of independence. So we work very hard to help you to maintain as much independence for as long as you can with your self-care by um, incorporating a consistent routine in your morning and your evening uh, uh, bathing and dressing routine. We may recommend zipper pulls or elastic shoelaces if you can't reach your feet or recommend how you can organize your kitchen so you can find items easier, or use of checklists or alarm reminders. These are all examples of adaptive strategies to maintain a healthy lifestyle for as long as possible. And again, they really vary what recommendations we would give based on the degree of cognitive loss. OTs also enhance recollection of meaningful memories. We help 
create a memory resource for those with dementia or more severe cognitive decline. These may include a gathering of family photos, audio recordings of loved ones' voices, familiar sounds like a cat purring, familiar smells like lavender, familiar tastes, as well as other sensory experiences that can help you recall meaningful memories. OTs also understand that social leisure activities contribute to a healthy cognition. These may include playing cards with friends, having family over for dinner, or joining a coffee clutch. These can all be extremely meaningful to you. So OTs work to find ways for you to maintain your participation in these activities or explore new ones. Research has shown that vision loss can, can often contribute to a cognitive decline. The Hospital for Special Care has a low vision center to help those with macular degeneration or other visual disturbances that are contributing to a cognitive decline. The OTs can teach you how to use high power illumina um, illumination and magnification aids, aids that could simplify your abilities to do money management uh, tasks in the house or, um, or use of a calendar or checkbook or a, a checklist. What we can do is after we educate you in using this equipment, we have the ability to give you this equipment free of charge. OTs also focus on managing adverse behaviors that can be symptoms of dementia and cognitive decline. We may educate you in movement and upper body exercises that uh, include music. We could also incorporate sensory activities that can help regulate your sense of light, your sense of hearing, taste, touch, and smell. All of these things can help calm your nervous system and help with anxiety and any adverse behaviors. Lastly, OT support the caregiver by helping the caregiver be mindful of their own mental and physical health, teaching them coping strategies and self-relaxation strategies, and being a resource to help them maintain their loved one's quality of life. I'd now like to introduce my colleague, Dorothy Villano, physical therapist. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and it's, it's a pleasure working with all of the members of our team. And I'm going to be talking to you about physical therapy and the role that we play in the Center for Cognitive Health. When Dr. Rinaldi talked about normal aging, he talked about just some of the mild changes that occur in terms of thinking speed or occasional um, difficulty with, hang on while I try to adjust my camera. Sorry about that. He talked a little bit about word retrieval problems, things that happen to people as they age that are, that are mild problems that we, we just see them as we age, but we don't express concern about cognitive decline. And a similar area of function that physical therapists work on is gait and balance. And with normal aging, we do see some changes in gait speed, walking speed, and balance function. But in individuals with early cognitive decline, we also see a change in gait function, speed and quality of gait. And oftentimes as physical therapists, we look for these, these changes and try to uh, pay attention to them and use them as clues to refer people over to the Center for Cognitive Health and then, and then recommend physical therapy early on to prevent a decline in, the, in that gait imbalance. Oftentimes, this early recognition enables us to intervene and reduce the risk of falls. And it's actually been shown that individuals can maintain their gait speed and even regain lost speed of, of gait with actually practicing with caregivers. So instead of just strolling along and, and, and moseying along, we can encourage people to walk quickly and safely with, with assistance. So we try to look at physical therapy early in the stages of cognitive decline in a, in a, with an eye on prevention so that we can not only improve physical function, but perhaps uh, have an impact on the, the overall disease process. 
certainly exercise uh, is, is effective for the whole body, for the heart and lungs and muscles, but evidence is showing that it can have an impact on cognition. It, and so our hope is we try to impact the progression of, of the condition. And just as Carolyn and, and Ali mentioned, caregiver education is vital. So we begin that right away in our process in physical therapy to teach caregivers what they can do to in, impact uh, individuals and their loved ones function, to, to prevent loss of function and de delay the progression of the disease. We, we, it's vital that we teach caregivers about fall ri risk reduction. So that includes some of the strategies that Carolyn mentioned, such as um, visually augmenting steps and doorways, taking care to notice if there are hazards in the house that can be reduced so that we have less, op um, less opportunities for falling, less tripping hazards. And, and, and the fall risk reduction isn't just about the environment, it's also about teaching people to stay active. Um, I think Carolyn mentioned that over time, we, we begin to step in, caregivers step in to try to reduce frustration in our loved ones and to try to do the tasks for people because things become more difficult and, and perhaps um, less efficient. But when caregivers can learn to continue to support their loved ones in performing tasks, and performing um, daily routines and mobility tasks, those tasks and skills and, and function are maintained and, and longer uh, throughout, throughout the person's um, life. So how do, how do physical therapists do these things? Well, we first of all, we do this, this work as part of a team. I think it's vital that we, we reiterate that we're part of a team with Dr. Rinaldi, with Ali, with Carolyn. We're part of an interdisciplinary team and we work together to try to individualize uh, what we do to, and apply it to each individual who is really unique um, with not really uh, something that we can say one size fits all in what we do. We try to create learning, low stress environments so, so that we allow learning to take place, but learning that's based on familiar, a familiar task that's kind of an automatic task. We might have somebody use strategies that they perform a task that's familiar to them and then we use that task to help build strength. There is a concept called errorless learning where, for example, if an individual has a difficult time standing up without pulling on a walker, we try to promote what's called errorless learning rather than having them put their hands on the walker incorrectly and then say, wait, nope, you got to put your hands on the chair and push up. We simply catch the error before it happens, help the individual place their hands on the, the armrests of the chair and push up so that when they experience that correct performance, they're more likely to maintain that function and, and learn that task um, without making errors and with lower frustration as a result. So we base our exercise on the individual strengths in, and experience and preferences. So we've had people that have always loved aquatic exercise and swimming. So we say, well, let's do Let's get you down to the pool and, and do some fast walking in the pool to work on gait speed. And let's work on balance in the pool and maybe even swimming if that's something that someone likes. And really, there's some people that always liked to do bike riding. So we might use a stationary bike. There's others that were happy playing um, a sport. And so we try to incorporate a sport into their, into their exercise. It, and I think Carolyn mentioned using music, music uh, cues. And anytime you can enjoy some, in, increase someone's enjoyment in exercise, they're more likely to carry that exercise out because it's been shown that this aerobic exercise is, is truly a vital part of overall health, but particularly in individuals with uh, cognitive decline. And again, we, I mentioned balance and gait training to reduce fall risk. And I'd say lastly, it's important to help individuals maintain these skills so that they maintain their health. We don't want someone just gradually saying, well, I'm gonna just sit here and, and let this, uh, you know, let this happen because it's everything's just too difficult and it's tempting to get discouraged, but we try to remind people, no, you can keep, you can keep on performing these tasks and we can give people strategies to keep doing things so that they maintain, so that you maintain your function as long as you can and stay healthy. So I think um, that concludes my, my 
part on physical therapy, I'd like to bring um, us all back together for a panel discussion, um, Dr. Rinaldi, Allison, and Carolyn. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for all that valuable input and highlighting the incredibly critical work that you all provide for the Hospital for Special Care and for our Cognitive Health Center. Um, you know, we would be nowhere without everyone's contribution. So this next part is going to be a panel discussion. And so at this time, if anyone who is uh, participating would like to pop any questions into the chat box, we'd be happy to, uh, I'll bring them up and be able to provide them for a discussion um, amongst us. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, several, I'm going to say maybe five or six years ago, I did um, <clears throat> I come to um, the hospital and was tested by Dr. Brown. It was a test, uh, it was mostly written and um, I mean, there was some of it written and some of it verbal and it went on for from early morning till around noon or one o'clock. And then the the results of that went to Yukon. And then I came back about a week or so later for the results of what, you know, he came up with. And he said, you know, if something, you know, like if in the future it just seemed like I was pretty absent minded and I was kind of like that my whole life. <laughs> so um and he said, um, you know, if things progressed, you know, come back and we'll review, review it again. And I found lately, I'm, I just turned 79. And I found lately that I am having more trouble finding words. And, uh, and I'm involved in a lot of different discussions, a lot of church activities and all. And it, it's come to my attention that some of my friends are finishing the words for me in a sentence. And um, so it's it's very it's embarrassing and it's annoying. And then I had COVID, and I think it's worse. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. much worse actually after COVID. I'm having a real hard time with um, with words, finding those right words. I, my brain isn't working fast enough for my mouth. So that's one of the things. The other things are Absolutely. pretty so, normal, you know, somewhat normal. Although I am having trouble parking in the right, <laughs> in the right place with a new car <laughs> in a parking spot. I'm just not used to the size of the car, apparently. I'll get out of the car and I'll say, you should have moved up more, you know, or you should have moved over a little more. And sometimes I literally have to get back in the car and straighten my car out. So that's bothering me. So there are some things that I see uh that are you know and i live alone my husband died nine years ago so and i live you know alone <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah. anyway i i don't of course. know and so it sounds like you know it sounds like you previously had a neuropsychological evaluation um with us that's that that may have indicated that the concerns you had may have been a, a long-standing but and it also you know, seems from what you're reporting that you have some concerns about these changes that you're experiencing and that they've also kind of been brought to your attention by, you know, other more objective observers. And so it, it would be, and, you know, I, of course, I'm biased, though, I think it would be reasonable to have, have an evaluation uh, completed again, and then ideally be able to make comparisons to that previous evaluation to see whether anything may have changed more than would be expected between 
time of the first evaluation and the second, that would be a, a little bit uh, worrisome for you. And this way, this it's really the value of completing these evaluations is to uh, allow someone else to determine whether these changes are kind of more normal aging or whether they're whether they're something more problematic. And so, I mean, I personally think that that would be a, a very a very reasonable uh, next course would, would sure. be to come into a complete an evaluation that depending on the results of those being able to, if word finding ends up being a substantial concern for you, uh, just as an example, being able to then refer you over to Allison and one of our other speech pathologists to help you help you find those words that you're looking for. And then when it comes to, you know, the visual part and the car parking and things of that nature, um, you know, that could be something just like new car learning and because you're 79 and driving a new car, it might be a little bit of an adjustment, but if not, then we can also help you try to help you try to better manage that. So I think, I think it'd be very reasonable to come on, to come on through uh, for a, a follow-up evaluation. Right. I've been through, um, I had surgery on my leg and foot uh, a year ago. <clears throat> and literally, it has taken a year for it to um, to come to a point where I can walk again. I mean, go for walks, you know, and all those physical activities. I didn't have a lot in the first mm -hmm. place, but I did walk a lot. And um, so now I'm okay. starting to walk thinking, okay, maybe that'll help my brain. And <laughs> I, don't know. I do read a lot. Sure. And I quilt. I quilt. And I remember when I had that yeah. original test, you know, that section in the test that you had to put things together and then switch them around and, and form another, you know, object. Um, I was good at that. <laughs> that was the one thing I was really good at. But I remember uh, there was one thing through this whole series that we did on objects. And I think of the word spatula. And it, it just could not come. It would not come. And she gave me a little extra time and all, you know, like, mm, you know, <laughs> and I was like, can't think of the name of it. So it just, you know, but that was the only one. So now uh, I'm not so mm -hmm. sure how many uh, objects I might not be able to identify. So I'm concerned because I do live alone, you know, and I don't want to be a burden on my kid. And I have a long term care policy that I'm not even sure can keep affording, you know, how long am I going to live? Mm -hmm. you know, kind of just to get an idea of what my life expectancy would be and how how I can improve what I have now, you know? So I don't know. Anyway, this was a very interesting, yeah. interesting thing. And um, I'm not sure the Hospital for Special Care is included in in my insurance <laughs> policy. I, I have a, a um, um, advantage plan. I don't know. Anyway, I remember that Dr. In, Brown wasn't. Was, he was, pardon? I was something? just going to say, um, at, at least in, in as it pertains to the insurance question, there was also another person in the chat that had a question about Medicare. Um, okay. You know, we are paneled uh, both individually and and hospital wide on uh, basically every major every major insurance panel. I, I mean, I personally have seen folks with multiple different types of Medicare Advantage plans. And yeah. uh, to my knowledge, I have not had any uh, difficulties with folks um, being told that uh, costs or that coverage would not be available okay. to them or that it would otherwise be cost prohibitive due to some sort of uh, some sort of carve out for uh, for for this evaluation. So um, I would it, it would it would really surprise me. You would be one of the first that I, I experienced that would not that would not have insurance coverage that's come in here looking for a neuropsychological evaluation. And you know, and you know, we also have a, a team of folks that would be able to help you know vet your insurance. We don't bring people in unless we know that we can get you coverage and be able to and be sure that there's something you're able to afford. And we do, we do pride ourselves on transparency and being able to be sure that you know. Or what to expect, you know, financially and interpersonally before you come to see us for any of the services that we have. So uh, I, I hope that doesn't uh, serve as a deterrent for you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry your experience right. frustrations, Helen. It sounds tough. Hang in there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think I just wanted to add 
even um, as a physical therapist, I'm probably least involved in the in the cognitive portion of 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 what we do. It's 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 interwoven into physical exercise. But I think uh, Helen raises some um, universal points of it, 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 in terms of the the stress and the anxiety and the worry and and how to manage things. And I think being in, a, in, a, in an environment like hospital for, for special care, I think it's really important that you're, you're able to access the support of, of, a, of a team and, and to help allay your, your concerns and, and have the information that you need and, and learn you know, what, are the, what are the strategies that you can employ and what, what things should you be focusing on? What things are more worries that maybe you don't need to focus on? But I think, I think um, you raise a lot of, probably what a lot, a lot of points of, that others are probably also thinking of in, in the group. Absolutely. And so we do have about five minutes remaining. So if anybody else has um, any additional questions, please go ahead and pop them into the chat box and we will, uh, we will address them. And then if there are any that are left over that we don't have time for, we can, we will gather them all and put together uh, responses as best we can to be able to send them out to folks after the program. And on the final slide, we'll also have contact information uh, for the phone number for the Center for Cognitive Health. So should anybody have uh, questions that they want to speak with our staff directly, if they want to basically know where to go to, to set up an appointment for themselves, they can uh, reach out uh, to that number. And you know, like most outpatient clinics, we're generally open from about eight in the morning till about four or five in the evening on a Monday through Friday. Um, one other important note that was just brought up on the screen is that we have coming up uh, run by our own Allison Gallagher mm -hmm. is a caregiver based uh, support group and she can probably speak to its uh, speak to its content and, and its value. So I will leave that to her. Yeah, so I'm I'm excited to be part of this because as was mentioned both by Dorothy and Carolyn is um, part of what it means to be a therapist for someone who's experiencing some changes in memory is to interact with the, the family and the loved ones uh, of that person. It's certainly difficult to be experiencing memory challenges yourself. And it's certainly difficult to watch that happen in another person you care about. So um, we like to carve out time that's dedicated specifically for our caregivers and that means, you know, either somebody who is paid to be a caregiver or someone who is a spouse, a, an adult child, anyone who is involved with the process of watching someone with a change in memory. And we have weekly classes. It goes for six weeks. And the content is all about how do we add to your toolkit? How can we equip you as a caregiver to feel like you're ready to take this challenge on and uh, remind you to take some space for yourself. Um, so if you have any interest at all in, in coming to that session, it is gonna start on September 22nd. They are virtual as is at like similar, very similar to this platform. Um, but we've had great experience with the Zoom platform in the past for these caregiver groups and we'd love to have you come. Thank you for that review, Allison. It's 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 been very well received so far from the folks that have uh, participated. It, it it really is a an invaluable resource. All right. No other questions. Apparently, the Zoom shyness also exists in outside of the professional uh, settings as well. And so I do want to thank everybody that was here for uh, for participating and, and following up. Uh, you'll see our website at the bottom and the phone number to contact should you want to set up an appointment with the Center for uh, Cognitive Health. And thank you all very much. We appreciate your time. Wish you the best luck with everything moving forward. And please remember that this lecture has been uh, recorded for everyone's convenience to be able to share with uh, family members and friends. So. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day and stay well. Thank we you. actually have a last minute question before we depart. Denise, oh. 
So I, I just wanted to reiterate, it was a wonderful session and it was very, very formative, but I forgot my phone had went off and I didn't get the prior information that you have as far as the caregiving classes go. Okay, um, Denise, can I give you my phone number? Do you have something yes, to read myself? Yes, it's please. 860-827-5242. Uh -huh. And I do have a direct extension. It's, yes, ma'am. It's 6354. Thank you ever so much. Of course. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you.